Welcome to your tangent on the fascia of the neck. The first fascial layer that we're going to talk about that is the most superficial is called investing fascia. Investing fascia lies just deep to the subcutaneous tissue. So if you're looking at the anterior aspect of the neck, it's going to be beneath the platysma muscle because the platysma muscle is embedded within the hypodermis. The interesting thing about the investing fascia is that it splits to enclose both the trapezius muscles and the sternocleidomastoid muscles, both of which are innervated by the same nerve. And so when you're dissecting and you're opening up the uh, fascial covering to look at the muscle fibers underneath, you're actually removing this layer of investing fascia. Also, you've already dissected out the parotid glands and that very thick fibrous capsule was also the uh, investing fascia covering it as well as the submandibular gland that you're going to dissect later on in this block. Okay, specifically the attachment points for the investing fascia, they, um, it goes all the way up to the occipital bones, that superior nuchal line that you were dissecting when you did the suboccipital triangle a lot of you are going to have this um, specific anatomic point removed when we remove the brain. That was the V piece that was cut off from the posterior aspect of the um, skull. And also the spinous process of the cervical vertebrae have already been disturbed, and so you're not going to be able to see those attachments. But you might look and be able to um, appreciate the attachment of the investing fascia to the mastoid process. Um, because that has been relatively undisturbed at this point. As you move up the sternocleidomastoid, um, you'll be able to palpate this bony landmark, and you can see that the uh, investing fascia attaches there. Um, most of you have already removed the fascial covering over the zygomatic arches because we already dissected the infratemporal fossa. And the inferior border of the mandible, as you looked for the facial nerve, you probably also disturbed that as well. So this picture, though, um, gives you a good idea um, here of where the investing fascia was located, although pretty much in this area is the only area that you're going to still see it in your cadaver when we dissect today. The deeper uh, layer of fascia the, it's in the anterior part of the neck is called the pretracheal fascia. And the pretracheal fascia has two parts. It has a thin muscular part that um, is depicted in this region here, and that encloses the infrahyoid muscles. And then it has a visceral part that is located in this region, and that encloses the thyroid gland, trachea, and esophagus. All of um, this fascial layer is continuous with each other, um, and we call that pretracheal. Now the pretracheal fascia, which you can see in green here in this slide, is continuous with a buccopharyngeal fascia, which you can see depicted here in gray. The buccopharyngeal fascia is um, the fascial layer that is around the pharynx. Now you'll be able to really appreciate the buccopharyngeal fascial layer when we disarticulate the head, and you can see how it's continuous with this pretracheal fascia. At this point, when you're just sort of getting into the neck from the anterior and lateral aspect, you don't really get a full appreciation for the pharynx. Now, the interesting um, part about this uh, pretracheal fa fascia is if you move inferiorly, it actually blends with the fibrous pericardium. And so um, the continuation of these fascial layers with structures in the thorax is a potential for spread of infection and extravasated blood. And um, so that'll give you an indication if you have an infection in uh, a certain area where it could potentially travel to. So um, when you're dissecting the infrahyoid muscles um, and pulling um, apart the pretracheal fascia, you'll notice that there are some thickenings of this fascia layer. And it's important for keeping a couple muscles um, stationary in the neck and giving them a different pool of uh, direction and changing their lever system. One is the digastric muscle. Uh, that muscle has two bellies and it is fixed in place by something we call the intermediate tendon. 
And so that tendon is actually a thickening of the pretracheal fascia, so look for it in lab. And the other muscle is the omohyoid muscle, also has two separate bellies, and it is held uh, in place um, by the pretracheal fascia um, and it thickening at that location. And you'll notice that when you dissect that area, that muscle kind of flaps free, and it's, it's, um, it can even be difficult to remember where it belonged after you've already um, disturbed the pretracheal fascia. The next fascia layer is called prevertebral fascia. And this is the deepest layer of fascia, um, <clears throat> respectively, to the pretracheal and the investing. Now, it actually encloses the uh, vertebral column and the associated musculature and blood vessels and nerves um, that uh, lie just lateral to the vertebral column. So you'll see muscles that we haven't seen yet. Um, you can really appreciate from uh, looking at the atlas, like the longus coli and the longus capitis. Uh, and you'll also see muscles attached um, and being ensheathed by this fascia layer of the scalene muscles, which will be really important for locating other structures of the neck, and some other um, deep cervical muscles as well. Now, when you uh, disarticulate the head, um, which will be after um, you dissect out the more superficial regions of the neck, you'll really be able to appreciate how the prevertebral fascia attaches to the cranial base because it's something that you'll have to um, cut through and um, sort of manipulate as you do this dissection. And the interesting part about the prevertebral fascia is that inferiorly, it blends with the endothoracic fascia. And so if you remember when we did the thorax, uh, the inner um, fascial layer of the um, thoracic wall was the endothoracic fascia. And that is going to be um, a superior or inferior continuation of this prevertebral fascia. And the other thing that you want to remember is that this prevertebral fascia that's, that's surrounding the um, vertebral column and its associated structures are, is going to continue laterally as the axillary sheath. You already disturbed the axillary sheath when you did the axillary um, artery dissection. But as you move deeper into the neck and you're going to be dissecting the brachial plexus, that is enclosed in this axillary sheath, which is a continuation of this prevertebral fascia. So make note of that. And the other thing that you're going to want to make note that of is that the cervical parts of the sympathetic trunks are actually embedded uh, partially in this prevertebral layer of the fascia. So when you do the head disarticulation, you're going to look for the sympathetic trunks in the fascia. So it looks like just thickenings at first, but then when you scissor spread and you, you get a good hold of this um, sympathetic ch trunk and chains and you look for the ganglia, that's where it's going to be located at. And so this is what it looks like when you're approaching the prevertebral fascia from a lateral side. So you can see that the, uh, the investing layer of fascia here is, is more superficial and it's lying on top of the sternocleidomastoid and the trapezius. If you were to cut away the investing fascia, and then you'll see that there are a lot of structures that lie deep to that investing fascia. There are many nerves and blood vessels that you'll dissect out in lab. But what makes the floor of that triangle is another fascial layer, and that's the prevertebral fascia. So it's the white layer that's in this triangle here, this posterior triangle of the neck. Okay, and this really isn't a fascial layer per se, but it is um, important fascia that encloses structures that you'll be dissecting in lab, and it's called the carotid sheath. Um, and so it kind of looks like it's a blood vessel because it's a tube, then when you're dissecting it, you'll, you'll first kind of be confused about what's, what the structure is. But then you'll um, scissor spread and you'll open it up and you'll see that there are actual large blood vessels and nerves inside this carotid sheath. It extends all the way up to the cranial base because the structures that are enclosed in this uh, carotid sheath came from um, the cranium. And it is going to be attached to the pretracheal and prevertebral layers. Although it's its separate fascial compartment, it kind of um, is attached to those layers, and so um, it's easy to kind of poke through when you're dissecting the pretracheal um, 
flash of the poke through and maybe open up the carotid sheath without even realizing you've gone through this additional layer. It does contain some very important structures. Um, it contains both the common and internal carotid arteries, depending on how high, high or low you are in the neck. The internal jugular vein, which you'll um, be able to see those structures usually right away when you open the carotid sheath. Other structures you'll have to dig around for are the vagus nerve. You may or may not um, be aware of some deep cervical lymph nodes that are inside this carotid sheath, depending on um, any pathology that's present in your cadaver. Um, and if you're very careful in your dissections, you might be able to find the carotid sinus nerve coming from the glossopharyngeal nerve. Uh, and you may also see, most likely, some sympathetic nerve fibers um, that are part of a carotid periarterial plexus that are little kind of spiderweb-like fibers that surround the arteries in the uh, carotid sheath, the carotid arteries. Okay, and that's for your tangent. Um, if uh, I found the fascial layers of the neck um, kind of challenging at first, and so I wanted to uh, have a little more detail part of this lecture, but I didn't necessarily want to take uh, 30 minutes or 24 minutes out of the lecture to go over all these fascia layers. And um, I hope that it was helpful for you, and I hope that it helps you in your dissections in lab. Thank you.